Hello everyone, this is Eric, the Asian movie enthusiast, and tonight I want to give you my general thoughts and experiences with Hong Kong cinema. It's a topic that I feel like talking about tonight, so I'm going to talk about it. The thing that really got me in the mood uh, was a YouTube channel run by the action star Scott Adkins, and he has recently, over the past few months, been doing some like fantastic interviews with people who are involved in making action movies. Um, a lot of people involved in like Hong Kong cinema, even like American action cinema, Thai action cinema, etc. So, uh, you know, whether they're actors, directors, whatever. So if you have not checked out Scott Adkins' YouTube channel, I definitely recommend it. Uh, some of his recent interviews have been fantastic. Uh, his last two were with uh, Cynthia Rothrock and Richard Norton. And uh, the, the, those two really, really got me in the mood to talk about Hong Kong movies. So I'm just going to start the video talking about my history and early experiences with Hong Kong cinema. And then I'm going to rather quickly go through a bunch of titles from each decade, starting from the 70s, that I would recommend that kind of stick out to me. So at the very least, you're going to get some recommendations out of this video. And feel free to comment down below about your experiences in favorite movies as well from Hong Kong. Now, personally, I had very limited experiences with Hong Kong cinema during my childhood. You know, like everyone else, I was familiar with Bruce Lee, and I watched his films, very much enjoyed those. And then there were like a handful of other kung fu movies that used to play on television, I think uh, on like Saturday afternoons or something like that, I remember. Sometimes they'd have ninja movies on too on Saturday afternoons. And uh, you know, I, I, I watched them on occasion. I wasn't really big into it. Maybe it was like the commercial breaks and stuff and like the, the dubbing and the, you know, like the cropping on a TV screen and all that stuff. It's kind of hard to get into them. But I do remember watching Master of the Flying Guillotine. I remember liking that one uh, when I was younger as well. So I had a few... There were a few movies that kind of popped out to me uh, during my childhood. But that was basically it. <clears throat> That's it. It was Bruce Lee and a few martial arts films. So you fast forward a handful of years, and then we get the international exposure for guys like Jackie Chan when he came out with Rumble in the Bronx in 1995. You know, Jet Li when uh, he was in Lethal Weapon 4 in 1998. And then Xiao Yun Fat when he was in uh, The Replacement Killers from 1998 as well. All of which I saw in the cinema. So somehow, well, obviously I saw Lethal Weapon 4 because it was a Lethal Weapon movie. But I think maybe word of mouth or maybe advertisements got me to, uh, to, to watch Rumble in the Bronx and The Replacement Killers. Because I had no idea who these guys were before those movies came out. <clears throat> And, you know, I enjoyed those. You know, Rumble in the Bronx was something a little different. Since I was unfamiliar with Jackie Chan's prior filmography, it was different from what I normally saw before, and it, I immediately clicked with that one. And that's not even one of his best, in my opinion, but it just, it, it, uh, since it was the first one I saw, it, it definitely hit me pretty good. You know, and it was a good representation of his, his style, right? And then Lethal Weapon 4, I actually thought was a, an improvement over Lethal Weapon 3. And I liked that movie. And I thought Jet Li was a very good villain. And I remember, you know, sitting in the theater, watching some other movie, and, like, the, the trailer for Lethal Weapon 4 came on, you know, months earlier. And, you know, it came through all the names, you know. Uh, 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 Danny Glover, Mel Gibson, Rene Russo, Chris Rock, you know, yada, yada. And it's like, and Jet Li. And I just, like, I was, like, giggling. It's like, who the heck's this guy? <laughs> like, I had no idea. But that movie was enough to, uh, to get me to watch some of his other flicks. And uh, if you haven't checked it out, a few months ago, I did a collaboration with That Fat Samurai Guy YouTube channel. And the videos on my channel where we go through like two and a half hours, we talk about Jet Li's entire filmography. So maybe I'll include a link to that video down there. Uh, that was a good video. And then uh, The Replacement Killers with Chow Yun-Fat. You know, I, this movie seems to have been forgotten. You know, a very divisive film, but I remember enjoying it when I saw it. <laughs> I haven't seen it in like 15 years, but I, I, now I feel like re-watching it to see if it kind of holds up. You know, I, I, I had a crush on Mira Sorvino at the time, and I believe it was Antoine Fuqua's 
feature-length debut film, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, I should rewatch that one. And so they all made an impression on me. <clears throat> and I started to seek out their other films. Now, in the late 90s, early 2000s, you know, Jackie Chan, Jet Li, Chow Yun Fat, some of their older stuff was making its way into video stores. So I would rent the VHS tapes and later the DVDs of a bunch of their movies. And I watched a bunch of them. And a few stood out. I remember the first time I saw Hard Boiled on VHS. And I remember the first 10 freaking minutes. I just put the movie in. I sat down on like a couch. And within the first 10 minutes, I had to roll up like a chair and, and sit within five feet of the TV. Because it was just, the, the opening 10 minutes of that movie is like, a great finale to an, any other action film. And it's just the first 10 minutes. So that movie just totally blew me away. I rewatched that movie like a million times. And then I still remember the first time I watched Fist of Legend, which was a remake of, of Fist of Fury. But I actually think Fist of Legend is better. And also the first time I watched Drunken Master 2. And both those films came out in Hong Kong in the same year, in uh, 94, I believe. So both of those blew me away because I never saw fighting like that before. I mean, and those are two just classics. Execution top-notch. And I do have separate reviews of, uh, I think, all three of those films on my YouTube channel. Uh, or maybe not Fist of Legend yet. I need to get a review up on that one. But we did talk about it in the uh, That Fat Samurai Guy collaboration, so technically I did review it. But I was still very ignorant of Hong Kong cinema outside of these guys and Bruce Lee. You know, I watched a bunch of this stuff, but I was still, I was a normie, man. I was still a normie. It's okay to be a normie. You know, I was one. So I, I you know, that was it. I didn't really follow up with anything else because I didn't know anything else, right? Then the big moment for me, and some of you will probably know this story by now because I talked about it when I did uh, a collaboration with Huss from A, a Touch of Film. It, it, uh, it was basically the summer of 2005. I was in video store and I was introduced to the girls with guns subgenre of action by mistake so I, I'm looking and I see this video and it's just sitting there and it's three girls three Chinese girls making cheesy poses and like on the top or uh, you know it was like uh, I turned it around I read the back and it was sounding all cheesy and at the top it said something like so sexy or something like that I'm like oh man this movie's going to be terrible. So I rented it just to see how bad it was. And uh, that was So Close from 2002, directed by Cor Yoon. And uh, they had Zhao Wei, Shu Ki, Karen Mok, and Yasuaki Karata. And that film, like, I remember watching it. And it's the same thing as Hard Boiled, believe it or not. I was sitting on a couch, just kind of, you know, just watching it. And like, oh, this is kind of cheesy. It's kind of fun. You know, these actresses, uh, I really like these actresses. They have charisma. This is a pretty fun little cheesy movie. And that movie, like, about the midway point, or maybe the two-thirds point, it just decides to get serious. <laughs> and then when it decided to get serious, I was, I moved up to the to the chair, rolled the chair up near the front. I'm like, wait, this movie's going to try to get, like, serious now. And I think it pulled it off. Because that final, like, 20-minute action scene, I mean, there's a lot of wires used. And you got three actresses that are not martial artists. But the way Coryun directed it, the way it was choreographed, it still works. That final scene I really liked. And the, the two-on-one fight with Yasuaki Karata is just, uh, that, that fight scene's legit. I really like that scene. So that movie, I mean, I finished it and I replayed it as soon as I finished it. Because, you know, I, I, uh, it, it kind of had this weird, profound impact on me, even though it was kind of a cheesy film in terms of how I viewed women in action movies. Because when I grew up, I didn't grow up with Hong Kong action. I grew up with American action. And we had, you know, Ellen Ripley. We had Sarah Connor, stuff like that. And, but the, the action design in Aliens or Terminator 2 is entirely different from girls with guns flicks in Hong Kong. Because they emphasize a lot of, uh, you know, martial arts, a lot of in-camera you know, uh, choreography and stunt work and stuff. So when I saw So Close, even though some people think it's like an inferior version to the old school Hong Kong stuff, it made a big impact on me. And then started going onto the message boards, like, uh, and people were saying, you know, it, it, it was 
it gets positive reviews, but some people don't like it. And the people who didn't like it were saying, hey, check out some of these older flicks. Because they made a bunch of them. I'm like, wait, wait, there's more movies like this. So I, I, I just went haywire. And that's when the gates just opened. Because I'm looking for all of these old school girls with guns flicks from Hong Kong. You know, from the 80s and 90s with like Michelle Yeoh, Moon Lee, Yukari Oshima, Cynthia Rothrock, Cynthia Khan, and all this stuff. And along the way, I started finding all these other movies while I'm looking for those. And it just, it, it, the floodgates opened. So, th so close was a big one for me. And so, it's okay, you can, you can laugh. I, I understand. So, before we start talking about specific movies a little bit, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rip through them pretty fast because there's a lot I'm covering. But let me give you a statistic. I, you know, I like my statistics. That nicely describes Hong Kong cinema in a nutshell from like, basically the 70s through to like the late 90s, up to the new millennium. So I looked at uh, all of the Hong Kong movies that I saw that were made and released in Hong Kong from 1980 to 1995, that 15-year period. And I looked at my, my little statistics, and I saw 403 Hong Kong films from that 15-year time period. Now take a wild guess as to how many of those films were dramas, dramatic films, out of 403. Uh, think, of a, think of a number in your head. Now, while you're thinking of your number, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to showcase a little, uh, a little drink I have here. Let me make sure this is in camera here. Got a little, a little Russian vodka, a little Russian standard. And there's another YouTuber who recommended this to me years ago. A movie Mayhem recommended it to me. And he said Russian Standard was excellent. But he recommended the Imperia. I couldn't find that. Uh, I got the Platinum version. So it's, you know, it's apparently Russian vodka that's made from a particular type of wheat, I believe. And I've already had some, and it's quite delicious. See, rum you could, or, uh, vodka you can drink straight if it's good quality. It's kind of like tequila. You know, tequila gets a bad rap. Vodka gets a bad rap because people drink the crap that's at the local bars. You find the good stuff, and it's uh, it's tasty. Yeah, it's got a nice, it's got like a lemon tasty note too, which I really liked. Yeah, it's good. So back to the the purpose of the video, right? So out of the four hundred and three Hong Kong films I saw, how many were dramas? Forty. Out of four hundred and three. So that means that 90% of these movies were genre films. Action, horror, comedy, thriller, etc. You know, that's crazy. Another question. Guess how many were action movies? Out of the 403 films that I saw, how many were action films? I'll give you another, just a few seconds while I finish this little swig of, of, of vodka. Ready? 251. So almost two out of every three films were action movies. That's insane. Now, to be fair, you know, this isn't an entirely accurate analysis because it only represents the films that I saw, you know, and what they export and stuff to international audiences. But I, to be honest, I mean, I was probably more subconsciously driven to the genre films, but... I was making an effort to watch everything I could get my hands on, including the dramas. And that's exactly what I did for Hong Kong cinema when I got to like the 2000s. I started going through like the 2000s and stuff. I watched tons of dramas from Hong Kong in the 2000s, which we'll get to. So, you know, this is just what I found. And that's ridiculous. And I need to emphasize that having an industry like Hong Kong that was pumping out genre films with unpretentious, reckless abandon was very important for me personally. Now, to put some context into why, you know, most of the, the Japanese and the South Korean films that I watch are dramatic films. You know, dramas represent the largest genre per representation from those countries, at least from what I've seen. And you know how much I love my Asian horror films. I mean, I watch every one of those I could find. And even then, uh, and I, I'm a huge fan of thrillers and romantic comedies from Korea as well. But still, I end up watching more dramas than any other genre because that's the genre that's given the most production in Japan and Korea. 
and I really love the dramas that come out of those countries. They tend to be a little bit more creative and interesting from some of the stuff I see from, you know, the U.S., and I, I've seen enough dramas from the U.S. growing up, you know, it's time to do other stuff. Now, taking that into consideration, that's a problem because it's easy for me to get burnt out on dramatic films, you know, if that's all I'm watching. So I was constantly needing to seek out genre films, horror, action specifically, those are my two favorite genres, to help round out and diversify my my movie viewing. So I'm turning through like tons of movies here. I call it like a, a cinematic diet. You want to have a nice well-rounded diet when you're eating? It's the same thing if you're watching a lot of movies. If you're not watching a lot of movies, you could just watch an MCU film every weekend and just cycle through them over the course of a year. You know, and that's perfectly fine. You know what I mean? But if I'm cycling through movies every night, you know, I can't be churning through just dramas. You know what I mean? Like, all the time. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, even if they're good, I'm going to get worn out. I'm going to get burnout. So I find that if I have diversity, I could just keep churning through movies. And that's, that's worked for me for 15 years. And I actually want to do a video on that and, like, my strategy and how I, how I diversify stuff. So Hong Kong cinema, I packed my rental queues. Either it's Blockbuster or Netflix. Uh, there was a, a, a website called eHit and Sinflix as well, two websites in the U.S. that were dedicated to Asian movies. And I would just pack all my, my rental queues with just Hong Kong movies, action movies, just Hong Kong movies in general. Because I knew, it, you know, my action fix is going to be, uh, you know, met. It's going to scratch my itch for action. It was very convenient. So, uh, you know, that's, that was big for me. So let's talk about some of them, right? You know, I'm going to go through them very briefly, but here's just an, an idea. You know, we'll start in the 70s. This one's a pretty short, very incomplete list I'm doing here tonight. But just here are a handful of titles that came to mind that I really like. You know, maybe some of them you have seen. You know, if I don't list something that you really like, you know, uh, you know feel free to mention it in the comments section. I'm not listing everything that I've seen, though. But it's just some stuff to give us an idea, you know, what we're talking about here. You had Drunken Master. I mean, classic from Jackie Chan. I do think Drunken Master 2 is a little bit better, though, in my opinion. Heroes of the East. You got Gordon Liu and Yasuaki Kurata. And Yasuaki Kurata is the man as well. That dude's been in some good stuff. He was in So Close. He was in Fist of Legend. And Gordon Liu is great, too. But Heroes of the East is one that I don't think gets enough attention. You got like a blending of Japanese, Chinese culture in it. And it's a very, it's just so entertaining. Like the, the story's even entertaining in that one. It's a little different from the typical martial arts plots. And the, the tons of weapons. I have a review of it on my channel. Check out my review. The movie's awesome. Magnificent Butcher with Sam O. Hung. Good one. 36th Chamber of Shaolin with Gordon Liu. The Mighty Peking Man. Oh, yeah. You know, Hong Kong didn't just make martial arts flicks in the 70s. They made rip-offs of King Kong. At least one. I saw, you know, this is the only one I've seen. The Mighty Pei King Man. I cannot put into words how essential it is for you people to watch this movie. If you're into giant monster movies, it is just hilarious. I, it could be the funniest giant monster movie I've ever seen. Like, it's like War of the Gargantuas level hilarity. It's, it's great. So if you have not seen that, I totally recommend that you watch The Mighty Peking Man. You have Master of the Flying Guillotine, uh, technically a sequel to The One-Armed Boxer, but I actually prefer Master of the Guillotine over that. I have a review of that one as well. Hapkido with Angela Mao. Now Hapkido, which I also reviewed on this channel, the one thing you'll notice in that one is that, you know, uh, female-led film in the 70s, really impressive. She's very impressive. But the choreography in Hapkido, you could take the choreography in that film, drop it into a film from 2020, and it would work. It is just, it was like, it just seems to be to be more fluid and modern, so to speak. Uh, kind of ahead of its time. So that's one of the things I noticed on that one. Really good movie. I mean, you got stuff like Crippled Avengers, Dirty Ho, The Super Inframan. Here's another one. If you want to do a... Uh, a Mighty Pei King Man, Super Inframan, double feature. Here you go. Super Inframan is a Hong Kong tokuzatsu film. Another Japanese, it's like, it's inspired from Japan. So it's kind of like Ultraman or Super Sentai. So if you want to see a Hong Kong version of Power Rangers, 
that's just wall-to-wall -wall action with people in cheesy rubber suits, you have to watch the Super Inframan. It's fantastic. It's so entertaining and cheesy. But make sure you get a widescreen version. I bought a, I bought a, a DVD. It had a garbage cropped uh, full sc screen. It was terrible. Uh, even if you have to get a bootleg, get the widescreen because you have to watch it widescreen. Five Deadly Venoms, Intimate Confessions of a Chinese Courtesan. That's one that's lesser known but quite good. Warriors 2, Fearless Hyena, the Brave Archer films are good. Black Magic, a little spellcasting horror in there. And you gotta be like Enter the Dragon and stuff like that, which was a co-production with the U.S., but it still kind of counts. I mean, I could keep going, but I, you know, we'd be here all night on just the 70s. A lot of fun stuff released in the 70s. And that era of Hong Kong cinema is just a bottomless freaking pit. I mean, it's similar to the 80s, and even the, some part of the 90s. It's just made so many movies. And to this day, I mean, I've still seen, I feel like a drop in the bucket of like the, the action flicks from the 70s. I keep working through them like slowly but surely. I mean, the 70s is still a bit intimidating to me just because there were so many kung fu films released. I mean, uh, anytime I see like a list of favorite kung fu movies, there's always movies on the list that I haven't seen. And I jot them down on a list and I, I gradually like get through them, you know, over the course of years. So it's a little bit of a blind spot for me, but it's, it's great. You know, it gives me something still to explore. Now, the 1980s. Things get pretty interesting in the 80s. Yeah, it's going to be a long video. Who cares? Some Hong Kong filmmakers, and I love this. I mean, you could just tell they just stopped caring about realism in the 80s for much of the decade. I mean, they just didn't care anymore. It's like, hey, let's just use wires for, like, anything. You know what I mean? And it was great. And it, it basically opened the door to all kinds of cinematic lunacy. I mean, yeah, hey, let's have uh, sorcerer movies, spellcasting movies with wizards, and, like, uh, crazy, like, fantasy films and all this other stuff. So you did have... You did have some lunacy going on in other parts of the world during the 80s, even in the United States. I mean, some crazy stuff. It's like nobody cared in the 80s anywhere in the world, which is what made it so great. And you could you get movies about anything. Um, some stuff totally inappropriate, and that's great. But, uh, you know, I look at stuff like America or even Italy. It's making some good stuff. But some of these Hong Kong movies, when you watch them, especially from the 80s and 90s, they're like they're made on a whole different planet. It's like, I don't know what these people were, were basically on when they were thinking of this stuff, but I'm glad they were on it because there's some really good stuff. If you want diversity in your cinematic diet, this is exactly the kind of stuff you should be watching because it's hard to find stuff like this anywhere else. Case in point, one of my favorite horror films of all time, The Boxer's Almond. I will champion this movie for the rest of my life. It's a freaking wizardry witchcraft horror film. Uh, the, Hong Kong did make a batch of these. They made a batch of them. You know, uh, like Black Magic in the 70s and some other stuff in the 80s and even into the 90s, but none of them can touch the Boxer's Omen in terms of just pure entertainment value. You have to watch that film. He Lives by Night. Listen to this one. He Lives by Night is a Hong Kong Jalo film. Uh, that's also a comedy. So it's an homage to the Jalo film while also being almost like a... Uh, uh, a spoof of it at the same time. So I, uh, for years, like I didn't even watch any Italian films really outside of some spaghetti westerns. And then again, in the mid 2000s, I got into like everything at the same time. It, it was insane. So I got into Italian horror and giallo films. And I, it's just, I could watch an Italian horror film every night for like months and not get sick of them. And uh, the giallo films are basically a combination of murder mysteries and slashers. And a lot of them were made in the 70s. Well, you know, there's others outside of that. So Hong Kong took that, and they said, okay, we're going to put it, make an homage to that and add some comedy. And I think He Lives by Night is a really cool flick. Very cool movie. But you have to really watch a few Jalo films before this to get what they're going for. You know, so I would say watch something like, you know, Tenebra, or some of Fulci's earlier films, like Lizard in a Woman's Skin, or Torture, Don't Torture a Duckling. Um, you know, stuff like that, or A Vice is a Locked Room and Only I Have the Key. The Italian Giallo films have the best titles ever. And uh, in that film, Edvig Fennec is the most beautiful woman of all time. 
in that film. Your life, your vice is locked room, and only I have the key. I'll just I'll just come out right out and say that. So yeah, the He Lives by Night's great. And then you have Girls with Guns. I mean, you have uh, In the Line of Duty series. I have a separate video on my channel. I cover basically all the films in that series. You have Yes, Madam, Michelle Yeoh and Cynthia Rothrock, Royal Warriors, In the Line of Duty 3, In the Line of Duty 4. Those first four films are, are awesome, basically. The first one, you know, I, I think is the weakest of the four. But, uh, I mean, Royal Warriors and In the Line of Duty 4, I think is available on Amazon streaming in the United States. So if you take anything out of this video, you will be watching Royal Warriors with Michelle Yeoh and In the Line of Duty 4 with Cynthia Khan and Donnie Yen. You're going to do a double feature sometime in the next week. That is what you will be doing if you have not seen those films. And if you don't like those films, I'll eat my shoe. So they are just like prototypical, exactly what I want out of a Hong Kong action film. And they have women in the lead roles just kicking all kinds of rear end. Now, Cynthia Rothrock. I did have a little bit of an experience with her when I was younger. Because they did broadcast some of her collaborations with uh, Richard Norton, but not the Hong Kong stuff, the American stuff, which is like C-grade, really low budget, not that great fighting movies. So stuff like the uh, China O'Brien films, Rage and Honor. I did enjoy them when I was a kid because, again, it gave me a little something I didn't see before. But uh, And I, I did rewatch a few of those a few years ago, and they actually are pretty good. I mean, you have Cynthia Rothrock and Richard Norton, the film's got to be pretty awful to not have it be watchable for me. Because I love those two. But again, you know, you go back. I didn't even know Cynthia Rothrock. I went like 15 years not even knowing she did Hong Kong movies. And then all of a sudden I see her in Yes Man. I'm like, wait, she did Hong Kong movies? Same with Richard Norton. I didn't know he did Hong Kong movies until I saw him in like, like Mr. Nice Guy or something. Some of Jackie Chan stuff. Or like City Hunter I think he was in too. So it's like... You know, and their Hong Kong stuff is way better than their American stuff. It's not even close. So again, that's just a little something I remember experiencing. You know, Tiger Cage with Simon Yam and Donnie Yen, you know, awesome action thriller. I did a review of that. Mr. Vampire, hopping Chinese vampires, freaking awesome genre blend, uh, bender. I have, a, you know, reviews of those up. Pedicab Driver with Sammo Hung. Sammo was money. As Tears Go By, one of Wong Kar Wai's best films. I would say that, Fallen Angels, and In the Mood for Love are, are pretty solid for him. You know, it's a little, you know, a little artsy-fartsy stuff to mix things up. Eight Diagram Pole Fighter with Gordon Liu. It's freaking awesome. I have a review of that up. Duel to the Death. This is one that no one really talks about much. Flies under the radar. You have this awesome fusion, again, of, like, Japanese and Chinese culture. The ninja in this movie are awesome. Like, Duel to the Death has some of the best ninja scenes I've ever seen in a movie. So if you like ninjas, check out Duel to the Death. And I think it was the directorial debut of Si Tung Ching, if I, uh, if I remember correctly. Casino Raiders with Andy Lau. I reviewed that. Good flick. Buddha's Palm. Completely outlandish and creative. It's just like, this is where you're just like going into like movies from another planet type stuff. Absolute must watch if you've not seen Buddha's Palm. It's a crazy, like, action fantasy type thing. I did a review of that on my channel, too. <clears throat> Miracle Fighters, which I need to review, but it's kind of hard to find nowadays. I would group that with Buddhist Palm in, term of, in terms of just pure insanity. The finale of Miracle Fighters has fight scenes and martial arts choreography and stuff. I, I've, I've just never seen it in anything else. So, if you want creativity, you got Buddhist Palm and uh, Miracle Fighters to check out. The Magic Crystal, with Andy Lau, Cynthia Rothrock, and Richard Norton. A Book of Heroes, one of Yukari Oshima's best. The Girls with Gun stuff, man. I'm a big fan of Moon Lee and Yukari Oshima. I think I need to uh, do some videos about them uh, coming up in the next year, which I need to do. And remember, some of these movies, they're not high art. You know, The Magic Crystal, I, I mean, come on. I mean, Miracle Fighters, like, if you're... If you're sitting there wondering, like, uh, like, oh man, I need, I need a plot and like logic, like, just, just leave it at the door, man. You go there for the freaking action and the pure entertainment value of seeing something you've just never seen before, you know. Uh, Aces Go Places Three, which uh, directed by Choi Hark, I think that was one of my favorites of that series. I got to rewatch those. It's been a while. 
Iron Angels, quintessential Girls with Guns flick. You know, great uh, loaded cast, really good movie. I did a review of that. The Seventh Curse, from the director of Ricky O, The Story of Ricky. So if you've enjoyed Ricky O, The Story of Ricky, and everyone does, check out The Seventh Curse. It's another one of his best films, in terms of just insanity. Holy Flame of the Martial World, completely nuts. Tons of wire-based action, and it's good quality. So again, you could like you could do combos on this stuff. You could do something like Miracle Fighters, Buddha's Palm, and Holy Flame of the Martial World as a triple header, and your head will explode. The Big Heat, cool, violent action thriller from Johnny Toe. So not everything was outlandish. They had some like violent action thrillers. On the Run, another good action thriller. You could do a double header of those two, Big Heat and On the Run. Zoo Warriors from the Magic Mountain from Troy Hark. I mean, that's good. Iceman Cometh, just action trash, but it's so entertaining. You have Yun Bao, Yun Wa, and Maggie Chung. That movie's so freaking stupid, it's unbelievable, but I'd be lying if I tell you it wasn't freaking entertaining. Five Element Ninjas, a Chinese Ghost Story. I mean, it just it just goes on forever. I haven't even talked about most of the Jackie Chan stuff, some of the Chow Yun Fat stuff, and Jet Li stuff. I mean, it just goes on forever. There's just so much great stuff in this decade, it's, it's unbelievable. So these are the kinds of movies that I use as a palate cleanser. Even today, to this very day. You know, if I'm itching for something unique and purely entertaining, these movies fit the bill. They fit the bill. I, and I love doing double feature evenings, you know, where I'll mix it up. Maybe I'll watch a drama first, and then uh, a purely entertaining genre film. You know, because I feel refreshed after I watch these movies. It's like my, like my brain liquefies... And it, it, like, stops working for a while, and then when the movie's over, it starts working again, and I'm refreshed. That's how this is. They're fun to watch, constantly just stuff I've never seen before. So it gets brownie points because of that. And you're not going to see stuff like this anywhere in 2020. I can guarantee you, you are not going to see The Boxer's Omen in 2020. You know what I mean? I mean, people don't even want to make 90-minute action films anymore. So, I mean, this is, you know... It's still valuable stuff to come back to and, and revisit. Then we hit the 1990s, right? Which is transitional period for the industry. There's actually a pretty good Wikipedia article. I don't know Wikipedia, but there is a pretty good article on the cinema of Hong Kong. Just search that in there. And it gives a, a pretty good high-level summary of the factors that led to the decrease in production in the industry and the shift towards more, basically more conventional films, conventional from an international standpoint. Uh, but still, the 1990s contributed a bunch of good stuff. They did. There's a lot of good stuff from the 90s. You know, Hard Boiled, Drunken Master 2, all-time classics, right? And Fist of Legend. I've already covered those. What's some other stuff here? The Tai Chi Master. No, not the Jet Li movie. I'm talking about the Wu Jing film, Tai Chi Master, which technically is a condensed version of a TV series where they loaded all the fights in a two-hour film and released it. And uh, it's it's one of my favorite martial arts films of all time. I mean, the story is kind of stitched together. It's still engaging enough of a story, but, it, you know, it, it, you do this for the... I mean, uh, the Tai Chi they show, it's so intricately detailed, and, like, there's so many fights. It's just a marvel to watch. I mean, it's it's totally worthwhile. And this is Wu Jing even before his prime. And he's awesome in this. I, I You have to watch the Tai Chi Master, but the Wu Jing uh, film, not the Jet Li film. I think the Wu, uh, the Wu Jing film was released on Tai Seng, which uh, DVD might be a little bit harder to find, but it is on YouTube, the English dub version. But still, just watch it on YouTube with the English dub. And if you really like it, track down the original. Uh, I think it's in Mandarin. I think it's in Mandarin. Bullet in the Head. Uh, I did a review of Tai Chi Master, by the way. Did a review of Bullet in the Head, too. Bullet in the Head, John Woo in top form. When I rewatched it recently, one of the best action films of all time. It's it's up there. I, I, I It's just phenomenal. I think it's it's better than some of his other more popular films. The Mission. And now, you're getting into a little Johnny Toe territory. All right? So, you, you know, a lot of people disenchanted with Hong Kong cinema, 
you know, right around handover, the handover to China time, which is 97, right? Johnny Toe was just hitting his freaking stride. You know what I mean? When, when people started complaining about the industry, he was hitting his, his prime. He, he, he did a lot. The Mission is a great movie. It's a suspense thriller. Running Out of Time, another Johnny Toe film. Andy Lau, Lao Ching Wan, another really fun movie. It, you have to maybe, uh, how can I say this? Uh, suspend your disbelief a little bit, but it's so different from a typical thriller. Really fun. Uh, it subverts expectations in the right ways. Where a Good Man Goes, another Johnny Toe film. A Hero Never Dies, another Johnny Toe film. This is just in like three years at the end of the decade. And they're all like really good movies. The Longest Night, produced by Johnny Toe, starring Tony Leung, Lao Ching Wan, one of the best action films I've ever seen. That's up there in, you know, it's one no one ever talks about because I don't know if it was just the distribution was just not good enough. It got a U.S. release, uh, physical media, and it still might be streaming on Amazon uh, Instant. I did a review of that one and uh, some of the Johnny Toe films as well. And yeah, you watch that. Watch The Longest Night and a Bullet in the Head in a double header. Your head will explode. Green Snake from Troy Hark. Very underappreciated fantasy. It, I don't even think it gets good ratings and I have no idea why. It's a phenomenal movie. One of my favorite fantasy films from Hong Kong. Ricky O, The Story of Ricky. It's, it's phenomenal, right? I mean, come on. It's... The funniest, goriest prison film you'll ever see. The Cat, from the same director as Ricky O. Watch it. Tiger Cage 2 with Donnie Yen, good fight scenes in that. From Beijing with Love, one of my personal favorite Stephen Chow movies. The parodies James Bond, the movie's hilarious. She Shoots Straight, more girls with guns stuff, with Joyce Godenzi, who... I, I don't know why Joyce Godenzi wasn't in more movies. I think... I want to say she might have married Sammo Hung at one point, but still, she should have been in, in more action flicks. I think she's got great screen presence and she can move. But, uh, you know, she made a few good ones that uh, I return to on occasion, but I really think she should have had a bigger career, lengthier career. License to Steal is another Joyce Godenzi one. Bullets Over Summer. Now, you could get some dramas in here, too, that are interesting. Bullets Over Summer with Francis Ng and Louis Ku, directed by Wilson Yip. The guy who did the Ip Man films. And then Beast Cops with Anthony Wong, Michael Wong, directed by Dante Lam, who's a very good director. So, again, Bullets Over Summer and Beast Cops is a double header. And remember, I reviewed a bunch of these movies on my channel. So, I mean, it's those are very good movies. Deadful Melody, a very underseen and underappreciated Wuxia film with Bridget Lin and Yun Bao. And, you know, I'm not even talking about a lot of those crazy fantasy swordplay films because they made so many of them, but they were making a ton of them in the 90s. And a lot of them are pretty interesting. Deathful Melody is one of my favorites, though. Big Bullet, loaded cast with good old Benny Chan at the helm. You know, this is one of Benny Chan's earlier films, and it's one of his best. And, you know, the guy, he recently passed away, and I'm really going to miss that guy. Benny Chan was a director who knew how to entertain. I think I only saw maybe two or three movies in his entire filmography that I didn't like. And, uh, yeah, so it was a rarity when I didn't like a Benny Chan. I'm going to have to do a, I'll have to do a Benny Chan filmography review because he didn't have that many movies. He only made, like, two dozen films. So maybe I'll revisit all of them and do, like, a filmography review. <clears throat> I'm going to miss that guy, man. He, he, he was great. And he's got one more left. I think he's making one, uh... Uh, the one that's coming out that he made with Donnie Yen. So I'm looking forward to that one. Expect the Unexpected. It's like a heroic bloodshed movie. That's a good flick. Beyond Hypothermia. Great double fe feature with Expect the Unexpected. Just violent, you know, gunplay, bloody flick. It's good. And then we get, speaking of bloody, you know, not only did you have all these like crazy movies coming out in the early 90s you had martial arts films you had girls with guns flicks so you had some good dramas but also in the 90s we had a, uh, a real up uptick in category three films with excessive violence and nudity so you have stuff like run and kill i reviewed all of these and i'm going to cover it run and kill red to kill the untold story in ebola syndrome a chinese torture chamber story or just a few that are totally just uh, very entertaining if you can handle them. You know, very entertaining. You get Simon Yam in some of them, Anthony Wong, directed by Herman Yao. 
And it's, uh, I reviewed all those. Check out my reviews. The Blade, one of Troy Hark's most badass movies. That movie's good. And Burning Paradise, one of Ringo Lamb's best. So a lot of good stuff coming out in the 90s here. Uh, you know, some of the stuff's in the early to mid part of the decade, but still, a lot of the Johnny Toe stuff is near the end as well as some of the other stuff, right? And The Blade and Burning Paradise, I always pair together for some reason, maybe because they came out within a year of each other, and uh, I don't know. I've always considered those to be like movies to pair together for a movie night. The Outlaw Brothers, one of Yukari Oshima's best. Angel Terminators 2, one of the best collaborations between Moon Lee and Yukari Oshima. And <clears throat> Fatal Termination. So, this is a Moon Lee film. And I want to note this film because it represents what I like about watching Hong Kong movies, even if they were totally immoral in how they made the film. So, Fatal Termination, and anybody who's seen this film is going to know what I'm going to talk about, <clears throat> has what I consider to be the most irresponsible stunt in motion picture history. So, the plot is like Moon Lee is is uh going against some bad guys right and um the bad guys kidnap her daughter and they you know they drive up in a car and grab her daughter by the hair and drive off well they don't feel like you know bringing the girl in the car so they're they have this like five-year-old girl hanging out of the window of a moving car while it's driving on a highway and like you could tell uh that they they had like a a metal arm that they bolted probably to the ceiling of the car. You can just kind of tell. But still, <clears throat> they're shots with her on a highway. And the car is moving. And this little five-year-old girl is like hanging out the window. Like hanging. <laughs> and when you watch that movie, you're just like, wow, man. Like, that's... I, I, I can't defend it morally. But, you know, that's part of what makes them so badass movies. And the stuntmen... I mean, hey, in, in a lot of these, these old school Hong Kong films, I mean, you just get the crap kicked out. I mean, listen to some of the Scott Atkins interviews with some of these people uh, that, that are on his YouTube channel. I mean, the, the one with Cynthia Rothrock, she talks about, you know, she'll show, she showed up at a Hong Kong, you know, in, in a Hong Kong movie shoot, and they just beat the crap out of her, you know? I mean, she's like, you know, bleeding from the ear. It, it, multiple people go to the hospital eventually. Not on purpose. It's just how they, they like to have that almost like full contact feel to the action. And that comes through in the movies. You don't have to like edit the crap out of a fight scene to make it look real because they're actually fighting in camera. You know, so it's it's a very kind of special uh, time in cinema history here because you don't even get a lot of that stuff nowadays. <clears throat> you get some of it, but in terms of martial arts, this this good. You know, you'll have some stuff from Indonesia and still some stuff from Hong Kong and you know in Thailand maybe, but. Still, you know, if they were making these, they were just churning movies like this out. So again, you know, Savior of the Soul 1 and 2 from Corey Yun, really crazy movies, really cool. Bride with White Hair from Rowney Yu. Again, I could keep going. The 90s were loaded too, you know. So it, I mean, it's, it, even just the, 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 the fantasy sword play flicks and the Category 3 films in and of themselves made the 90s a memorable, you know, decade for Hong Kong cinema. Then the 2000s hit. Now, production in the 2000s just fell through the floor. Uh, that's an indisputable fact. I mean, Hong Kong used to make like hundreds of movies per year. You know, in, in, the, in the golden age, I guess you could call it. And then by like the early 2000s, there were some years they only made like 50 movies or something like that. Like, that's a big drop. And again, you know, that, uh, that Wikipedia article has, a, has a, you know, the basic basic reasons that this is this some of the things that caused it like piracy and, and all kinds of stuff so at this point the distinct style and nuttiness and creativity and lunacy of films from the 80s and 90s basically is faded out <clears throat> and you have a very different industry now in the 2000s favor i say in favor of more conventional narratives in movies i would say some people do not like what Hong Kong cinema became from, like, you know, late 90s or 2000 and forward. I'm going to say it now. Hong Kong cinema of the 2000s, I really like it. I really like 2000s as a decade for this industry. I understand the problems that existed and, and the shifting of styles. 
but I still think they made a bunch of really interesting movies. Infernal Affairs, one of the best crime films of all time. I know that's low-hanging fruit, but Beyond Our Ken. It's not even a romance. It's an anti-romance from Ho-Chunk Pang. I freaking love that movie. That was one of the first artsy-fartsy movies, for lack of a better term, art house films that I fell in love with. It was Beyond Our Ken. I love that movie. Isabella, another fantastic film from Ho-Chunk Pang. Everything Ho-Chunk Pang did in the 2000s is worth watching, even his less, less impressive stuff. He was kind of on a roll. And he had a distinct style. You know, you could tell it was directed by him. So it's not like it's just, uh, you know, these aren't like bland dramas you get everywhere. These had like very distinct type style into them. And then we get Johnny Toe in his prime. I mean, you got Full Time Killer, Running on Karma, Throwdown, Election, Election 2, Exiled, Mad Detective, and Sparrow. All of them, in my opinion, are top tier entertainment. Every single one of those movies. And he directed all of them in the 2000s. I mean, in my opinion, Johnny Toe is the greatest Hong Kong director of all time. Of all time. I mean, I should probably make a, some type of video as to, you know, detailing out why I feel that way. But the dude, I mean, he's just the best. I'll say it, I'll say it now. The dude's the best. I mean, you have the best director in his prime. It's got to be a good decade. <laughs> At least a good decade. The Pang Brothers. The Eye, The Eye 2, Abnormal Beauty, Diary, Recycle, and The Detective. All solid films from the 2000s. Mostly horror films. A few are co-productions with Thailand, but they still count. And I, I, I never really understood why people like crapped on the Pang Brothers after they made The Eye. It's like everybody liked The Eye, and then everything else they made got it was like divisive or something. And I just don't understand it. I mean, I think The Eye 2 is as good as The Eye. I mean, Abnormal Beauty, Diary, Recycle, The Detective, and the recent Oxide Pang film, The Big Call, I think are all more interesting films than The Eye. So, I, I mean, I like The Eye, don't get me wrong, it's a solid horror film, but I, I don't know, it's just when I was on the internet in the 2000s, it just seems like the Pang Bar was just getting crapped on all the time, and I'm like loving all these movies. So, I don't know, maybe that's an unpopular opinion that I have. Donnie Yen got his second wind. Listen to all the stuff that's going on in the 2000s, people. Donnie Yen got his second wind. If you look at Donnie Yen's career from the mid-90s to the mid-2000s, there's not a whole lot to champion as, like, really good movies. I mean, take a look at that filmography. And then he teamed up with Wilson Yip, made Killzone. Bam. It's, it just took off again, his career. You know, he made uh, Flashpoint, It Man, just to name a few. I mean, it's it, it, it was good stuff. Eye in the Sky, one of my favorite Hong Kong films. Great surveillance thriller with Simon Yam. Uh, the overheard movies are good. Accident, really good, good paranoia dramatic thriller. It's like paranoia uh, with uh, Louis Ku. Invisible Target, loaded cast, just no nonsense. Well, there is some nonsense in it. Crazy action flick directed by Benny Chan. Probably the most glass that they broke, or at least was shown bro broken or breaking on screen. It's got, it has to have the record for most broken glass in an action movie. It's ridiculous. And speaking of Benny Chan, our good friend, New Police Story and Connected were really good as well. I think New Police Story is one of the most underrated Hong Kong action flicks of like the last 20 years. I mean, that's a really entertaining movie. And uh, yeah, Benny Chan, man. Time and Tide. A return to form for Choi Hark after his Van Damme flicks. Remember, remember when Choi Hark did The Blade, which is awesome? And he's like, yeah, I want to make some crappy movies with Jean-Claude Van Damme. And he directed uh, Double Team and Knock Off. And then he went right back and made Time and Tide, which I don't think was financially successful, but it's a freaking good movie. Crazy in the City, really good cop drama with Eason Chan and Francis Ng. Fatal Contact with Wu Jing. After Killzone, you know, Wu Jin got a bump because he was a great villain. And he, he tried to make it on his own. And it, it was kind of a mixed bag in terms of, of success at the box office. And uh, he went through a little slump at the end of it, like right around the 2010, the end of that decade, until he came back with, you know, uh, Killzone 2 and Wolf Warrior 2 and stuff like that. And then he took off. But he was like having struggles around 2010 area. But he still made some good stuff after Killzone. I think Fatal Contact is underrated. The Beast Stalker. 
Awesome thriller from Dante Lam. It's great. Stephen Chow was making movies like Shaolin Soccer and Kung Fu Hustle. Both came out in the 2000s. In the Mood for Love with Wong Kar Wai. Dog Bite Dog, which I recently reviewed. A nice Cat 3 Shocker. And there's... And, you know, and some people don't like the cheesy stuff from the 2000s. You know, it's like, oh, they're, they're pop stars flying around on wires. Some of it's entertaining, man, to me. It is. Maybe that's why I like the decade. You know what I mean? Because you have the cheesy stuff peppered in, and I kind of like it. I mean, So Close is an example. The Twins Effect. I mean, it was directed by Dante Lam, and Donnie Yen did the action choreography. I mean, I don't care what anyone says. Like, that last fight with, uh, I mean, you have two pop stars, two little pop star girls, Jillian Chung and Charlene, Cho- uh, Charlene Choi, fighting against a room full of vampires. And it's, it's, there's no way you'll ever see a movie with that premise with fighting that good ever again. You know, I mean, because, I mean, this is like Disney Channel level, like, plotting. And the, the, the fight scene was way better than it had any right to be. Uh, Gen Y Cops, little Benny Chan cheesiness. Dragon Tiger Gate, Donnie Yen at his absolute cheesy best. With the ridiculous haircut. It's, I, I like that movie. And then Skyline Cruisers, which I reviewed again. It's just really dumb stuff, but I, I just like what they were doing. It, there was something going on there where... They just had enough talent to make these movies, like, entertaining. So I think there was a lot of good stuff in the 2000s. I think this era of Hong Kong film is very underappreciated. It's very underappreciated. It, yeah, it was a different style to the films from prior decades. Uh, not as much lunacy and creativity. But I think a lot of it's good. Uh, when I was really getting into movies, right around, you know, 2000s, uh, mid-2000s, a lot of people online complaining about the Hong Kong film industry. At the time, I didn't understand. I really did not understand those complaints because I was exploring all of it at once. So there were nights where I would do Mr. Vampire from 1985 and then follow it up with Infernal Affairs from 2002. And then I'd, or I'd start with Eight Diagram Pole Fighter from 84 and follow it up with Isabella from 2006. And all these movies were awesome. So I like had no problem. I was like... Well, the industry changed, but it you know, helps to mix it up a little bit, you know. Um, over time, though, I learned to understand their frustrations because the changes in the industry were pretty pronounced. But looking back on it, I, you know, if, if, if you're a critic of Hong Kong cinema in the 2000s, don't you wish the Hong Kong cinema in 2020 was like it was in the 2000s? Because I sure do. You know, I do. And we arrive at the 2010s now. And, you know, at this point, Mainland China is just making its presence felt. Uh, you know, tapping talent from Hong Kong, come over and make Chinese movies instead. Uh, more co-productions, which kind of blends, kind of lose your identity when you're always co-producing movies with another country, you know, or the mainland. Made it more difficult to distinguish uh, your industry. All kinds of issues. And then, really, during the second half of the 2010s, I got the impression that Hong Kong was making even more generic kinds of dramas. I mean, there were times where I'd read a plot synopsis for a Hong Kong movie, uh, you know, during the 2010s or second half of the 2010s, and I'd say to myself, I've already seen that drama like a hundred times before from other industries. You know what I mean? If it were were 90-minute action extravaganza, I wouldn't mind, because no one makes 90-minute action extravaganzas anymore, at least not not in the style of uh, what Hong Kong was doing. So, you know... If Hong Kong was still churning out the kinds of movies they made in the 80s and 90s, that would still be a good thing. Even if the industry just just stagnated in the sense of just making the same movies over and over again with different talent, I would take that right now. You know, because no one makes those kinds of movies anymore. I mean, so nowadays, I feel like, you know, I'm always waiting for, like, a new action movie to come out that I actually want to see. It, it takes effort to find these movies because... Everyone on the internet only wants to talk about superhero films and Star Wars all the time. So I got to do all the legwork myself. (laughs) You know what I mean? I mean, it's it's not easy. So it's, you know, a lot of the time, sometimes I'll just try to find a Hong Kong flick from 70s, 80s, or 90s that I haven't seen. Or maybe rewatch one that I have seen before and, you know, get my action fixed that way, which is fine. You know, Hong Kong did make a bunch of these types of movies, so... Even if I re- you know, cycle through them multiple times, I still have enough of a mix. But I would prefer a greater contribution from the modern era for this kind of action movie. 
90 minutes. You know what I mean? Real stunt work. You know, lack of CG effects. You know, things shot in camera. I mean, I, I would I would really like this. And it, something's really annoying me because, I mean, like, Indonesia could be making more of these movies. I mean, you have the Raid films, The Night Comes For Us. You know, even, like, Headshot was solid. You know what I mean? I mean, it, but for... And the thing is, when I when I reviewed Gundala, that's probably one of the reasons I was so frustrated. You know, because you, you guys, like, Timo Cicanto did The Night... He wants to make a sequel to The Night Comes For Us with Julia Stell in the lead role, which is what I want to see. And he's, like, begging people for the money to make it. He's like begging, hey, can somebody give me money to make this movie to one of the best action films of the last, like, 20 years? And he's having trouble finding money. But, oh, it, it, these Indonesian producers will toss a few million dollars to some crap superhero movie like Gandala. You know? Instead of, like, mining what they do best and making their mark doing their own stuff, they get a copy Hollywood making garbage, you know, movies. It, uh, ugh. It, it, that's one of the reasons why I was so frustrated with that movie. But anyway, you know... In recent years, also, to add to the frustration, we have some duds from historically reliable directors. I mean, Johnny Toast had some duds here and there, but when I saw Three from 2016, I mean, that was basically just a crap film. And Johnny Toast doesn't usually make crap. So that was kind of, uh, yeah, that was disenchanting. And then Ho Chung Pang, who I've been talking about tonight, he made Misbehavior in 2019, which was just dumpster juice. And I did review that one. You know, I didn't even review three because it was like I didn't feel like I was like depressed. Uh, the Pang brothers kind of gassed out in the early part of the 2010s. I did like the Big Call though from 2017. That was that was a good flick, but that's a Chinese film, so I can't even count it. So yeah, that kind of adds to the frustrations. But still, 2010s. Let's look at a few good ones here. They did make uh, some entertaining Hong Kong movies. Some of these are co-productions. With the mainland, so just keep that in mind. Drug War. I think it's one of Johnny Toe's best. I have a review of it up. The Ip Man sequels and spin-offs, most of which I think are entertaining. I like a lot of the sequels and spin-offs to Ip Man. They, they had a formula, but they stuck with the formula, and the formula works. And not a lot of people are making movies like this now, so I'm fine with it. And speaking of Donnie Yen, 14 Blades, Wuxia, also known as Dragon, Special ID, Kung Fu Jungle, and Enter the Fat Dragon, even though that's 2020. All entertaining flicks. So Donnie was still making some good stuff in the 2010s. Dream Home from Ho Chung Pang. Uh, even though we kind of gassed out after that a little bit. Great Category 3 callback film. Dream Home is a great, almost like slasher film. Really good. Revenge of Love Story, another nasty Category 3 flick. So right around 2010, I'm like, oh, are we going to be getting a few Category 3 flicks every year? And we didn't after that. Maybe those movies didn't make money. You know. Um, maybe they just didn't make money. But uh, they still came back with The Sleep Curse. I think in 2017 with Anthony Wong and Herman Yao directing. Another Cat 3 callback. So at least we had three Category 3 callbacks in the 2010s. So that was nice. Love and a Puff. That's another good one from Ho Chung Pang. Sequel is not quite as good. Journey to the West Conquering the Demons from Stephen Chow. Dante Lam. The Stool Pigeon, Fire of Conscience, Unbeatable, Operation Mekong, Operation Red Sea. Again, most of those are co-productions with China, but they're great freaking movies. Cook Up a Storm with Nicholas Che, good flick. It's a cooking movie, a little different. Kill Zone 2, I think was a good good flick. Wu Jing, Tony Jia, Jin Zhang. Once Upon a Time in Shanghai with Philip Ng and Andy Young. Like, you have the talent, guys. I mean, listen to the names I just listed out. I mean, even, even Nicholas Che, he can do action. I like when Nicholas Che is in movies, action movies. He's got a, a distinct style. I like his action. Wu Jing, Tony Ja, Jin Zhang, Philip Ng, Andy Young. You can make a, like two or three action movies just with those guys every year. I mean, I, I don't understand what the problem is. <clears throat> you know? And that's one thing. I think Jackie Chan should have just retired after New Police Story retired from acting and went into producing and directing and thrown his money back into the Hong Kong industry and kept it rolling. You know what I mean? Just kept it rolling. And you have enough talent. You're telling me if Jackie Chan was directing these guys and choreographing the fights that they wouldn't make good movies, you know, and they do make good movies occasionally, but not to the frequency that it should be. I mean, Philip Ng is underused all the time. 
You know, even Andy Young, he's underutilized. Use these guys. I don't get it. Uh, Motorway, different kind of car racing movie. I think that was produced by Johnny Toe's production company. Good flick. The Way We Dance, good dancing flick. Believe it or not, it's a good dancing drama. Benny Chan, he had Shaolin and Call of Heroes. Full Strikes, a good comedy with Josie Ho. Cold Steel is an underseen one that's quite good. It's an action flick. Saving General Yang from Ronnie Yu. And then there was some horror movies that came out in the decade. They had a Hong Kong flavor. Like uh, Tales from the Dark 1 and 2, Hungry Ghost Ritual, Rigor Mortis, and Keeper of Darkness. So, you know, it's and there was some other action stuff I didn't mention. Firestorm, The Viral Factor, Helios, Shockwave, The Brink. So occasionally you'll get some action in there. You know, you will. Still in the 2010s. But it's kind of like a drip from a faucet. You know, it's like the 80s... The faucet was on high, high, and then now it's like it's like a dripping faucet. You're sitting there, like, like with your th- your tongue out, trying to get the next one that falls, right? But uh, you know, that's obviously not everything. But you could feel the industry kind of sputter in the 2010s, I think. And then the recent Chinese conflicts and the current world situation have made things worse. So, kind of tough to tell how Hong Kong cinema is going to contribute into the 2020s. We'll have to see. You know, we'll have to see. But in the meantime, we can keep digging into all these older flicks that they made already. Because they made a ton of good stuff. So, you know, just keep digging through the older stuff and uh, be happy with what they did produce up to this point. That's basically what I do with, like, the Italian stuff. You know, I'm still finding Jalo films that I've never seen before. You know, so it's in some Italian horror films I haven't seen before. And, then, you know, you just keep churning through those and, you know, we'll see. It's, it's pretty cool. But that's basically what I wanted to cover tonight. You know, not a comprehensive study at all, but I just wanted to cover, uh, talk, talk about some Hong Kong stuff. You know, some opinions and stuff like that. Uh, you know, it's, it's I, I'd like to review, well, I have reviewed a bunch of Hong Kong films already, but I like to do more list videos on the Hong Kong industry. You know, because most of my list videos have been for Japanese movies. And once I'm done with my big project list video, like the 200 Japanese film recommendations from the last 100 years or whatever I'm doing, I only have like four or five parts left on that, maybe. So once I'm done with that, maybe next year I'll do some Hong Kong list video, like, like you know, 10 Yun Bao movies, or uh, I definitely need to do some uh, Girls With Guns lists as well. So we'll you know, do some of that. But uh, always fun. Hong Kong cinema is fun. You know what I mean? So, what are you, some of your thoughts or experiences with Hong Kong cinema? I mean, you know, some of the ones that you really liked. You could tell me in the comments section if you like. And as always, we'll see you next time.